my relationship with mining is that of a uh, toxic relationship that you rushed into too fast um, and you can't get out of now. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. My name is Jarrett. Today I'm joined by Tatum Cave, who is a fellow Compass Mining colleague and the host of the podcast Between Two Asics. Today, Tatum and I are going to talk about two ideas. One, decentralization versus centralization when it comes to overall global hash. And we're going to talk about the evolution of hardware, the evolution of miners within the industry. Tatum, how you doing? I am good. I want to point out that uh, Between Two Asics is not a podcast. Uh, we go over that several times throughout the episodes, um, but uh, not a podcast, but happy to be here nonetheless. Could you dive into that more? I guess I missed that. Is it more of an experience, a, a spiritual journey for the listeners? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think, uh, I, I don't know how it started, but I guess it was after like the first two episodes, um, people started saying like oh i love your podcast and i i was like everyone has a podcast this is not a podcast this is a talk show like stop calling it a podcast and i, I remember it i played into it on the third episode with btc sessions where um he i was like i did this whole dramatic intro just like zoomed into me and i was i was like it's never been released audio only it will never be released audio only this is a talk show between two people in person it is not a podcast, so stop calling it a podcast. And immediately he goes, thanks for having me on your podcast. It's just, it, it's just always been I, – I had a merch idea at one point that never went to production, but it was just in my font, not a podcast. But I still might run that. Still might run it. I think you should because actually this is some real behind the scenes. When we started this show – I was thinking we, Curtis and I, Curtis Harris and I had similar conversations about, let's not think of it as a podcast. It's a show. It's a conversation with industry leaders. Let's get people on that are talking about interesting things. Let's push conversations forward. Let's have people on that, you know, have stories that maybe aren't what you think of when you think of Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining. And so kind of along the same lines. However, we are on Spotify and we are on Apple. So I <laughs> did not know that uh, Between Two A6 is not on those. I guess that makes sense because I've only ever seen it on YouTube or clips of it on your X. But anyway. Yeah, and I, I have released, uh, I, I did pivot a little bit with Between Two Nodes. Um, it was my longer form, more serious uh, conversations. I've only done three episodes of that, which I want to start doing those a little more, but those are on Fountain, Spotify, Um so check those out. I think they're on Spotify. I can't remember. It was a little blip, a little little side project, but uh, they are on YouTube as well. So check those out. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, let's dive into something that you constantly talk about on your X, and I see it when I'm on my personal X and when I'm on Compass's X, and that is the idea of the decentralization versus centralization of hash rate. Now, I have to be 100% frank with you. I am not really sure how the breakdown is currently and maybe what some of the concerns are when it comes to, hey, is hash going to be too centralized? Obviously, that is not something we want. If we live in a hypothetical world where 95% of the hash rate is you know within 100 miles of Dallas-Fort Worth globally, that's not a good thing. That's just not a good thing. What if ERCOT were to go down? What if there was some EMP? I'm just going to play devil's advocate, right? Then this idea of a decentralized ledger, a decentralized network really loses a lot of its luster. So obviously we're not there where 95% of it is within 100 miles of Dallas-Fort Worth, just you know, in Texas. But where are we today? And you know, what are the concerns that you see that maybe other people aren't seeing? So... When you talk about decentralization and mining, there's kind of two sides of it. You have physical decentralization and then also digital decentralization. Um, and the physical decentralization, which is the idea of having all of your miners of uh, on the network in a physical close close proximity to in a physical location, um, that to me is not a concern uh, right at, at least right now. And I don't think it will be uh, with the different advancements that are coming out as far as like solo miners popping up. Um, like, I mean, it's ridiculous how, how much hash rate is just coming from like bid access specifically. Um, but then again, you also will always have operations 
in uh, all over the world because it's a competitive market as far as energy goes. Um, and you, you really need three things for an effective Bitcoin operation. And that is uh, power, internet, and cooling, really. Those are the best, the, the main three things. There's a bunch of stuff under each of those things, but um, where you find that perfect trifecta of all three of them, that's never going to be a consistent uh, Denver, Colorado. Like Den Denver, Colorado is the best apex of all three of those. It's always going to change. Um, and so you have places all around the world uh, with different different power agreements, different power agreements, different uh, power sources, um, different uh, environmental factors, X, Y, Z. And I don't think that that is a problem or will be a problem. And I know that <clears throat> we're in election year and uh, Trump had been has, has embraced um, has embraced Bitcoin and his platform and talks about all the Bitcoin being mined in America. I don't think that that's going to happen. It would be great to embrace that and and make it easier for miners to mine in America without, you know, fears of uh, government takeover or something like that for whatever it may be. My main thing that I've been focusing on is digital decentralization, and that's on a protocol level. And it's specifically talking about block template generation. Um, and just a brief overview <clears throat> of how uh, how mining works essentially right now in very, very, very layman terms. Like th this is even beyond my understanding fully to the full extent. Uh, and it's a very hard concept to understand. But basically, if you are mining to a pool, you are essentially you're donating your miners hash rate to that mining pool in exchange for some of the reward. And in the most basic sense, when you talk about pooled mining, whenever the protocol is kind of switched up to, um, I, I guess it's a get block template, I think I, I, I wanna say, was when that it was created for pooled mining. It, it's basically like, uh, one of the best examples I ever gave was uh, one that I made up off the top of my head and it was after a few drinks with the boys and I was just trying to explain mining. Imagine there's a physical cube in, in the sky and you want that cube. That cube has a secret number in it and it said, Hey, if you guess this secret number that's inside this cube, I will give you some money, AKA Bitcoin. And you start guessing, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you look across the street and, Oh, Jared's over there guessing too. He, uh, 99, 100, 100, 100, 200, I'm like, okay, well, I gotta, I gotta go quicker. And 42 is the magic number. And that block is like, yo, Tatum, guess what? You guessed it right. Here is some money for guessing that right number. Then you look up, same thing is happening. Well, Tatum's like, hey, Jarrett, I got an idea. How about we both guess? I started one, you started a hundred. And if our, if one of us gets the number, then we split the reward. So, you know, we're, we're putting in equal amount of work and we're, uh, we're spreading the reward equally. That's basically what pooled mining is or was, or is supposed to be ideally. The way it works more, more complex is that the pool that you are mining for, uh, say for instance, um, F2 pool, just a very common pool, one of the larger ones, F2 pool is running a mining node or multiple mining nodes, depending on the uh, stratums, I think. I'm, I'm not really sure at that point, but they are generating the block templates and saying that this transaction can go through, this transaction can go through, this transaction can go through. And you see a lot of that. You can go on mempool.space and uh, use mempool goggles to see like ordinals, um, inscriptions, BRC20 tokens and all these other types of transactions, the templates that the pool is creating are allowing those types of uh, transactions to get in. And we saw a lot of people start to understand this whenever Ocean comes uh, on the scene and they started using different templates. They, they started using knots instead of core. And 
any block that they have, if their miners get it and they're hashing to Ocean's uh, templates that they use that filter out uh, ordinals or whatever it may be, then those transactions that fit into that template go into that next block. The problem is it what I think happened over the past year or so since Ocean came on the scene is that Ocean, um, it, it kind of became an ethos debate kind of of like, well, I can, it, it's, it's inscriptions or not inscriptions. Which side are you on? Good guys, bad guys. That was not what I saw. I saw that there is, when you're hashing to one of these major pools, whether it be F2 pool or Luxor or Brains or uh, Ant pool, you are basically building something that you are not, you don't know the end product of. You may not want to be building that. And that's completely up to you if, you, if you're cool with it or not. But for instance, the, the four megabyte block that Luxor mined with the Taproot Wizard, there were several people uh, who were hashing to Luxor's pool and they were hashing towards getting that transaction cleared, which was an out of band transaction. If you look at that block on, on the mempool, there were no fees paid for that. Meaning that, uh, that was whatever deal happened for that block to be mined happened outside of the chain. And so if you were hashing a Luxor, Maybe you wanted to mine that taproot wizard, maybe you didn't. The thing is, there's no transparent, verifiable way to see what was paid for that block to be mined. So did you get gypped on what what your fee structure was supposed to be for you know the the fees that Luxor got, but you were hashing for them? Does that make sense? Um, and then also later on I did some more research and talked to some people and figured out that a lot of these block templates that are being generated are literally from the same entity, which is Bitmain, essentially. Um, and there, there's a lot of maps and Merkle trees and stuff that uh, some people a lot smarter than me have um, have made, such as, uh, gosh, I, I forget, it, it's a 0x something. He has a whale as a profile picture, but... Uh, he did a good analysis. A guy named Parker also did a really good analysis. Um, but basically, a ton of these pools are kind of white labels. They're they're Bitmain doing business as something else, some other pool. Um, and inherently, it's not a big problem just at the face value, but it is whenever you realize oh, this is taking up like 47% of the network right now. Um, and so that's why it, you have these other pools that are popping up, like the uh, solo pool, CK pool. Those are two solo mining pools. Um, you have Ocean, who's using their own block template generation. Basically, block, tem block template generation is not decentralized at the moment. And it poses a possible threat that could result in a reorganization it, uh, it which i doubt that will happen like that's not that's not the biggest issue i think the biggest issue is censorship because if some some higher up government entity maybe goes to bitmain and says hey this address can't be can't send receive or um, this type of transaction the government could effectively ban ordinals or even regular financial transactions because they can <clears throat> censor, I guess, what is being put into that block. And so that's the issue that we're facing because it's all just one big white label, essentially. And um, everyone, whether you think that you are working for someone or another person, we're all kind of working for Bitmain, which is the kind of very scary fact. Wow. Sorry, that was kind of a rant right there. I, I did no, not that mean was to go. Good. That was good. You, I didn't know the backswing. That was good. 
Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around everything that you've just said and make sure that I, I, I understand. So I may say some back and, and fill in the gaps where I'm missing them. You're saying that right now, when it comes to the templates, 47% of transactions is that is, so, uh, is being, are, you know, are being processed with this template. Is, is that the number? And is that the proper way to say it? This was, uh, probably, Two or three months ago, it was about 47. It, it had been floating around that 50% range. Uh, but basically, the the templates are being generated by Bitmain or Bitmain white-labeled companies. Um, and basically, Bitmain is saying... Bitmain could just be like, I only want to include transactions from this address that's my address or something like that. And if they make a template that will only allow this trans this type of transaction in their blocks, then around forty seven ish percent of miners would be hashing just to get my transaction through without any say in it because Bitmain basically said, "Hey, this is the template that we're going to use now." Um, and there's there's a lot of power that is held there and the scary part is that a lot of these people who are mining at large scales they're not doing it because of you know they they want to they're not they're not like fully ethos driven bitcoiners and that's totally fine a lot of these large scale mining uh large scale mining businesses are profit businesses so they're going to go where the profitability is within the pools and they don't care if Bitmain's making their block templates or if Tatum's making their block templates, they're going to, whatever block templates given to them, they're going to go for it. Yeah. I was having a, that conversation yesterday with someone that compass, like every single mining company, public or private has a large amount of people on their team who we're doing this with GPUs and we're doing this with CPUs. And maybe this is where we evolve into the conversation of hardware evolution and they've been doing this for years. And now they find themselves working for a publicly traded company with a CEO that maybe has some background in mining, probably more like HPC, maybe not even, maybe they're just brought in to just help pump the stock. And now we're just living on quarterly vibes. And so once that happens in that world, you're gonna go to the thing that's probably gonna get you paid out the, the, the quickest. And you may start to, like you said, I love the way you said ethos driven. You may move away from some of the more ethos driven decisions that you would have made were you not a publicly traded company, were you not, uh, you know, run by someone that maybe hasn't been around long enough to see the value and hey, we need to be careful that these certain things don't happen and even be aware of the template centralization and the fact that 47 or up to even 50% um, are using that template. Is this something that you Sorry, hear? Sorry, can I, can yeah, I add on to what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, please. Because this, this touches on something that I've, I've kind of added on to this whole argument is that like me and publicly traded companies have a very complicated relationship um, because one, it's cool to see a publicly traded company doing what you're passionate about mining. Like that's a... In Bitcoin mining is literally acknowledged at the New York Stock Exchange. Like, that's cool. However, uh, I encourage a lot of anyone listening to uh, go back to the unconfiscatable 2023 live streams on YouTube and find the debate public versus private mining. It was one of the greatest debates I've ever seen. I was happy to be there live. I mean, it, it was that, that gif of Joe Rogan where in uh, the other commentators at the UFC table where they're like, oh, that was literally what the whole crowd was doing the whole time. It was awesome. But one thing that was that was pointed out uh, from the publicly traded companies on, on their side was that pubcos are profit companies. When you go public, you're then officially a for profit company. That's what matters to your investors. That's what matters to all your shareholders. And that's where maybe that ethos is kind of just given away. So it's like, okay, you have this powerhouse of a publicly traded company that no longer cares as much. And they could say it or whatever, but like it's all in the hands of the shareholders. 
they don't care as much about the ethos of Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin as they do about pumping their shareholders bags, essentially. And you see that with um, I, I have a crazy relationship with this company too, Marathon. Uh, I love Marathon and their whole pool situation. I actually do support how how they're using their pool from my understanding of it. Um, and people will argue about, you know, ordinal's good or bad, or whatever. I don't care about that. They're they're basically helping the problem in at the bare bones. But they came out, I think, last quarter saying that they were mining, I think it was Caspa, uh, as a, a diversification. And it's like we've seen this cycle plenty of times with mineable shit coins, uh, uh, altcoins. Um, and Shannon Squires actually gave a very good, uh, I like basically overview of it is that whenever a mineable altcoin comes out, that miner will have a little second of insane profitability. Like sometimes you'll see some of these, uh, non-Bitcoin miners with mineable coins having profitability of hundreds of dollars a day. The problem is that they're like there's they're always a limited run. They're always going to be smaller than than Bitcoin miners. Someone is going to scoop those up, and as soon as those get plugged in, that profitability always goes negative. And you see that now with so many other coins that were mineable that don't even have a market. Uh, I collect old miners for whatever reason. I'm a psychopath. I have a couple in my window and on my refrigerator and stuff. But uh, I get a lot of people to just send me random stuff that they find. And some guy sent me one. He's like, I don't know what this is. I don't even think it's a Bitcoin miner. And after doing a ton of research, having to reach out to a ton of different people, figured out it was a Zag Z1. And the algorithm was some long name that I had never heard of it mined like three or four different coins one of them was called Galactrum which honestly is just objectively a cool name like I would become a Galactrum maxi if it was just on the namesake but every single coin that it mined has no volume now and it hadn't for for years and years and years but there was a market for these actual machines that would go in these crazy data centers and they're just all all dust now so that's my thing with publicly traded bitcoin mining companies is they they turn into a profit company and that is a problem yeah i don't have a problem with any publicly traded company in any industry i think it's one of those situations where they say don't hate the player hate the game and the game is once you're a publicly traded company, you're beholden to your stakeholders and your only game in town is then find as much profit as possible. And yes. when you started to talk about publicly traded companies and your gripe with them as though you had broken up with them or something, I was looking at my phone and Chipotle CEO recently got hired by Starbucks and was given, you know, coming in with stock, like, I don't know, hundred million plus in stock incentives or something. And the reason why I got hired is Chipotle has been killing it. If you're into looking at stocks, Chipotle has just destroyed over the last like 10 years. It's been a wonderful stock to own. And so Starbucks is a, a company that's getting a lot of different competition. Coffee as uh, I guess a commodity is something that's going to be highly affected and is highly affected by climate change. And I say this because I've lived in two of the biggest coffee growing countries for many years in this hemisphere being Guatemala and Colombia. And so Starbucks is struggling and they're saying, all right, what do we do for the shareholders? Well, we need to bring in a name. You know, we need to, we need to go sign the LeBron James of getting our stock pumped, which is this guy who was at Chipotle, which is just a total move to pump the stock. I'm sure that he'll come in and he'll have new ideas, but Starbucks has moved away from a couple cafes in Seattle where they had good coffee, and they had a you know a, a, a cafe and, and an entire brand that people loved and trust, and now they're just this behemoth, right? Um, and they moved away from that because the incentive to grow your stock is a snowball that rolls downhill, and you just see how big you can get that snowball before you have a problem. So, anyways, I could talk about the the, the perils of probably going uh, go you know going public and and then being a publicly traded company and and the things that come with that. But you brought up. 
this Zag 1 Z9 or whatever you said there. Uh, that coin is an objectively cool coin name. Sometimes I think that one of the issues with Bitcoin is the brand. I think it's great. The idea of a bit and coin, we put it together. It's super simple. It's easy to pronounce in many different languages. But if it was just called internet money, I just think there'd be so many, so fewer questions on the front end from 95% of my friends. It's like, oh, this is value on the internet that I can use to send to anyone. Okay, I got it. You know, when it's Bitcoin or when cryptographic currency, these are two things that people don't understand currency and they don't understand cryptology, uh, cryptography, excuse me. And I'm, you know, not into cryptography. We have many people at Compass who are, which is great. Um, but let's go right into, we've talked some about the centralization, the decentralization. I will put up also, you called out the unconfiscatable 2023. Let's get that link. We'll put that in the description so people can go find that. Let's talk about the evolution now of miners and where we've been. In 2021, full disclosure, I couldn't, uh, my buddy and I in his basement with the power that we had access to and we looked online and we could not get an ASIC for a reasonable price. So we were mining Ethereum at that point, full, uh, you know, full, uh, full disclosure. Many people, however, in Bitcoin and even in Compass and throughout were doing similar things just because they had GPUs sitting around. Uh, we, we got a bunch of graphics cards and that was the only thing that we could get with the money we had. And we looked at the power and we're like, okay, this will work. We've come a long way. Obviously, Ethereum has now gone to proof of stake. And this is obviously a Bitcoin show. I just kind of wanted to call it out and that the evolution of how these things used to work. I think many people at Compass I've spoken to, maybe yourself, probably yourself, used to just have, you know, used to be running this on, on, on CPUs or GPUs. And that's how they got into it. They were like, oh, I have an old computer, you know, and this is long enough ago that they could just fire that up. And one of the, um, I will pass the mic. I feel like I'm on a, a little flow here. But one of the things I shared with Brad James when he came on the pod was that. Great guy, by the way. Great guy. Minor Mastery and Mining with Brad. Shout out. He, when, when he came on, one of the first things I said, the stats, because this blew my mind. I was getting ready. I was like, I'm going to talk to Brad. We're going to talk about the evolution of, of Bitcoin mining. In 2016, the global hash rate, because that's when he started, was one exahash. Today, you and I are talking and it's, I don't know, 650, 660, could we go down to 600. Uh, maybe it oscillates up to 700. I mean, it all, it all depends. So that's grown unbelievably. Just, just. Just, you know, one to 600 is an unbelievable, that's an exponential growth, which is really hard for people to kind of wrap their head around. Um, most humans don't understand exponential growth just because we're used to, you know, something grows 10% a year. That's great. So point being back when it was at one exahash, you could do a lot different things. And as Brad called it, hillbilly mining, by just, you know, throwing some stuff in a closet, making sure, as you said, it was cooled and had the energy when did you start mining and whatever that looks like? And maybe it wasn't Bitcoin. I've been here, full disclosure, on, on my Ethereum. When did you start mining and what were you using when you started? My relationship with mining is that of a uh, toxic relationship that you rushed into too fast um, and you can't get out of now. Um do you, I actually want to get out of it now. It sounds like it's a toxic. <laughs> it sounds like a little bit, a little yeah. bit, but I can't. Okay. Um, because like your therapist, your therapist is like Tatum. <laughs> maybe you should, you know, go. I don't know. Teach kindergarten. Maybe finger <laughs> finger painting will make you happier. You know, but you're like, no, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, yeah. It, it's it's a constant battle. I, I I love to hate it, but no, I I, I absolutely love it. Um, I've only been in mining in, in the industry, honestly, knowing anything about it for two and a half years. The first bit of mining that I ever learned about was when I joined Compass. I didn't want to do anything in mining whenever I was looking for a job in Bitcoin. I wanted to do something on the financial side. I got a degree in banking and finance. I know, ironic. Um, <laughs> but I joined Compass. That was the first bit of mining that I ever ever got into just working for Compass. And then um, I started learning a little more about it as I was just learning about the job and thought it was kind of cool. And I was kind of understanding it a little bit, like what it actually was and 
and why people did it. And at the time, whenever I joined, it was uh, it was right. I want to say it was right around uh, the latter part of coming down from all time highs. So like mining, mining equipment was a money printer. Um, and then I was thrown right into the bear market where, you know, some of these machines that were going for $14,000 were then, you know, 300 like that. That's a crazy drop because when you're mining, your rewards are denominated in Bitcoin. The dollar amount changes with the price of Bitcoin. So when you're mining at $70,000 and your energy rate is constant throughout the year, like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. We are getting roughly the same amount of Bitcoin, but we're just making insane profits because each Bitcoin is worth $70,000. Okay, it dropped to 15000 this sucks. I am losing a ton of money because I can't sell any of this to cover my electricity costs. Like I'm making the same amount of Bitcoin roughly, but it it, it is worth $15,000. And that's a huge drawdown. Um, and that was where I was like, okay, this is, this is a whole entire market. Like this is way bigger than I can ever imagine because I started learning what goes into a facility, what goes into... Uh, power agreements, what goes into actual right equipment. And I'm actually still working on a research uh, research piece with uh, a couple of people on the value of ASIC miners over the course of time, because each miner has different value to different people. And the latest and greatest might not be the right one for you. It might be an older one based on a variable variety of different things. Um, the first actual miner that I was mining with, it was, uh, I guess it was towards the end of 2022. Uh, this is about when I started Between Two Asics. I was wanting to do Between Two Asics. I needed two Asics to be between. And I also didn't want to spend a ton of money. I was looking up like scrap Asic miners. I didn't want to pay more than like a hundred bucks for two pieces of equipment that was just going to sit on my sides. So on eBay, I found an ant miner S seven, two of them for like 40 bucks. And I think it was probably just some guy I found in storage room or something. Um, and it was like, I don't care. And he was like, Hey, I have a third one. I'll throw it in for an extra uh, 20 bucks. I was like, no, don't worry about it. He's like, okay, I'll throw it in anyway. I'm like, okay, whatever. And out of curiosity, I was like, let me see what these things are about. And I was playing around with it. And that This is the first ASIC miner I, I got my hands on. And I was like, this is a lot more simple than I thought. Um, and one of my favorite things is when people call them supercomputers. Because, like, I understand. I thought they were supercomputers, too. That thing cannot tell you the day of the week it is, if you ask it. Um, it was made to do one thing and one thing only. And anytime I'm teaching someone about uh, ASIC miners and, and especially with uh, repair and like diagnosing and, and testing, reading logs, I basically say that it has three hash boards and it has a control board that is the liaison to you. You tell the control board what to tell the hash boards to do and it will tell it, the hash boards will be like, we can or can't do it. This is why. And sometimes that control board is an alcoholic. That That's where I, that's where I like use that language of like it, a firmware flash is like a, a, a cold drink of water after a night out or something like that for, for a control board, stuff like that. And that was actually, so that was the first miners that I actually got. And it just went downhill from there. I was like, I, I love these. These are fun. And I don't know why, but I, I now have a collection of several of them. And I, I need to post some pictures. I have a, a V9. I have a M29, which no one's ever heard of. Uh, I have a few up there, too. Um, and I have some <clears throat> some J-Pros. Like, just a ton of different stuff that I like experimenting with, playing with, learning about. Um but yeah, it, it started as an S7. Then I actually ended up doing, uh, making a few space heaters and uh, using an S9 to heat my office. Um, and then it just continued to get worse. And I was figuring out how to get 
240 volt power to my dad's office, yada, yada. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it, it's, I, I have a problem and I recognize it, but, uh, it's fun though. It's fun. I think mining technology is going to be crazy. I still have an iPod two. This came out in like 2003, still holds about 25 minutes of charge and you can still play music on it. I don't know if I can put more music on it. So it's a lot of like notorious B I G. And is it the, the scroller? Things. It has the, uh, yeah. the screen and the, the ring on it. Yeah, yeah, Honestly, that was a great design. Why'd they ever div pivot from that? I don't know. Because they got into touch. Once they got into touch, they got really excited. Once they realized, because so the first one, the first iPod, and the reason why I talk about iPods is kind of builds into, I think, the question I want to ask you. But the first iPod was really chunky, and it had uh, it had the this wheel that actually moved. And I have the second one. So it was a wheel that didn't move, but it was in a wheel. Oh, it was the touch. Was uh, the I, touch. That's the one I'm familiar with. I didn't know that they actually had like a rotary one. Yeah, they had exactly. And then that one had four buttons and then it had a wheel and and had the middle button was something as well. It was, it was really cool. And the reason why I say that is eventually, as you know, and anyone listening, the iPod was discontinued, right? And there's throughout history, especially more modern history when it comes to tech, there's been all these things that we thought we would never, ever move away from. There's a famous article, I want to say in the New Yorker or something, that was just talking about technological innovation. I read it in like 2012, but it was talking about Kodak. And it was saying that like 2008, 2007, Kodak, I believe it was Kodak, they ran the world when it came to photography. And I know you're into photography, your father's also into photography. But by like 2012, 2013, the iPhone was out. It was iterating. It was on around an iPhone 5. And basically digital camera had dropped off. All the older film, film cameras were basically the market was gone. And now there's just novelty. I have many friends who have some of the old 35 millimeter and they just have the cameras hanging around their house because they're just novelty. Novelty, that's a great way of putting it because like you, – you you have I've I've seen several um like YouTube shorts and TikTok accounts that that specifically play with like old film cameras because be, but like the work that goes into it like you'll see these guys they'll they'll have to pick out the film that they put it in wind it up and they have to play with all these different analog settings they're not like digital settings where you, you can go even automatic or something like that like actual dials and stuff and and th they're not easy and that one thing that my dad um my dad's a photographer and he used to do a ton of event stuff he doesn't do event stuff as much because everyone turned into a professional photographer and whether that be phone cameras which now even more than back then whenever this was an issue like i'd say probably you know, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, also, d uh, just digital handheld point and shoots like that. Those you the amount of college girls that started Instagram photography pages because they got a camera and they lasted like two months. Like it's ridiculous. And it, it did hurt my dad's uh, not necessarily hurt his business, but it, it was like you had people undercutting them. And it only lasted like a year for some of these events because like, okay, maybe we should have stuck with a professional photographer, you know, and he got to the point where he was like, ah, they'll be back next year. And they always were, but, but yeah, it's, it's all novelty now. It's all novelty. And, and the reason why I bring up the camera industry is because everyone is kind of, if you're listening to this, is kind of seeing how that looks. And I know exactly what you're talking about. When I went to events in college, they would put the disposable cameras on the, on the tables. And now if you go, it's a QR code or a hashtag that everyone just puts up to the to Instagram or to a social network. And so the idea of a photographer is maybe it doesn't hurt his business directly, but the brand and the overall kind of potential need for that can be lost, even though I don't believe that to be true. A, a photographer has unbelievable skills. So with that said, the novelty, you now have miners hanging around your house. It's like a miner cemetery in there. When... You know, CPUs, GPUs, now we're with ASICs. Is there something, I guess this is the question, I don't know if there's an answer to, but I kind of want to float it. Is there something beyond the ASIC? The story in my head just due to technological innovation is yes, we can't see what that looks like, but we should be open to the fact that there is. And is there also a chance that in the future, it will all just be immersion? 
I don't know this to be true. I don't know this not to be true, but if mining is being done, for example, just in Texas and Texas is going to continue to heat. And you said at one of the first things you said was, Hey, cooling is so freaking important. If immersion becomes the most efficient way to cool miners in that world, is everything just going to be immersion? I don't know. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. So what do you think moving forward things will look like? Cause we've gone from being able to, you know, use a laptop or use a, a desktop computer to then having some graphics cards running to now you needing certain ASICs. I, I don't know. What is the future and what are you seeing and what do you think will happen? And once again, we're kind of in a kind of in a in a part of this episode where people are going to say this is dumb, maybe. But it could also be something that we look back on in six years and be like, dude, we were uh, pretty close there. <laughs> hey, we kind of did something yeah, there. We might want to share that um, clip again. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to ask this. And it's weird because the answer is, I don't know, but, uh, it was something I was thinking about leading up to this conversation. I I thought about it a lot, but especially leading up to the conversation, I was doing a little more research, just kind of rejuvenated my interest. But the, for those listening that don't really know the brief history of, of mining, you have Bitcoin that was created 2009 and the first block was mined by Satoshi with a CPU, meaning that every laptop, every computer has a CPU. That's what was being used to mine blocks. Later on, I don't remember exactly what year it was, uh, the efficiency, they figured out how to mine with GPUs, which is also in every computer, whether it be a, a just a basic, you know, I just need to make sure that GPU stands for graphic, uh, oh wait, hold on, graphical, Pro, graphic pro, graphics processing unit. Jeez. Oh, wow. Um, I was going to jump in, but, but I was like, you got this. <laughs> I, I, I got scared for a minute, dude. I used to build PCs. Yeah, I don't know if people um, can see it. The sweat. The sweat. Just a beat, a beat of sweat. <laughs> it's like I'm about to cancel out everything I just said. Um, but people figured out how to mine with GPUs. And GPUs, whether they're just really basic, I need to plug in a basic monitor just to see my graphic user user interface on my computer or a super impressive beefy RTX 4090 uh, want to get all the frames per second whatever it is like those were made to do something that bitcoiners repurposed and then again uh, ethereum and other other mineable coins that would use GPUs as well after that, the efficiency was with FPGA, which is Field Programmable um, Gateway Array, I think. Uh, those lasted a short time as well. The efficiency became ASIC miners after that, which uh, I, I, I do a bad job of this. Uh, the box that you see with the two, the two fans on the front, the big metal box that makes all that noise, that is not an ASIC. That's a... ASIC miner that has sometimes 300 something ASICs within it. Uh, each hashboard has X amount of ASICs in it. So I do a bad job in my show saying between two ASICs is actually between like 300 something ASICs. But um, you with the ASIC miners, that that was 2013, whenever the first ASIC was released. I think it was January 20, 2013. 2009 to 2013, Four, uh, four years, you had CPU, GPU, FPGA, ASIC. 2013 to 2024, over a decade, we're still on ASICs. So that's what makes me think, are we at our stopping point? What is next? If there was something next, why have we not found it out? Because there is this is now an entire industry. Like I said, this is the, there are companies who are being publicly traded <clears throat> that like have insane, the market capitalization on Bitcoin mining specifically is a, a enormous, way more than it was in 2013. So why have we not gone past ASICs? And I don't know what the answer is. Is there anything after it? I don't know. Are we still trying to figure out what the most efficient ASIC is? Maybe so, because the efficiency of ASICs has evolved. Uh, I think the first ASIC, the, the size was... 
130 nanometers, I want to say, and now we're around like five, I want to say, for the latest and greatest, most efficient ASIC chips. Um, I could be wrong. Don't don't fact check me on that. But it's it's some something ridiculous at this point. And that number also like 130 to five. We're we're trying to get as low as you can. There's a point of diminishing returns, according to Eli, who you should really get on the pod. He he goes nerd mode on this. It's awesome. Um, but it's like where where do we go from here? Do we try to cram more ASICs on a hash board? At some point, things just start exploding and not working. Like, do we make the ASICs bigger uh, or ASIC miners bigger and put more ASICs there and it's just a larger power draw? Then you bring up immersion. I will go on record, and I am loud and proud about this. I hate immersion, okay? Um, But with ASIC miners, the primary uh, cooling method has been air cooling. There's also immersion cooling. And there's also hydrocooling. Hydrocooling is what I'm mo- most bullish on. We're always going to have air-cooled miners, but there's also going to be more innovations to adjust how the cooling affects these ASIC chips because I think that's where the stop point is. And we haven't found that yet. But with the hydrocooling miners, right now you're seeing them in industrial grade uh, like the what's miners, uh, oh, I forgot what series. When, when you work with ASIC miners, you get all these letters and numbers jumbled up. I think it's the M60 something. Um, but it's a really big, it's really big. Like it, it's a couple hundred terahash, but it's also 480 volts. Even if you're like a pleb miner that's running a, a, a mining shed, you still can't plug that in. Like that, that's just not, it's not for, it's for the barrier of entry for hydro mining is extremely high. I think that barrier is going to break down um, and that's going to have a market effect when whenever pleb miners are able to actually start hydro hydro cooling miners uh, because also immersion is always going to have that high barrier of entry. There's, there's plebs that have created small scale immersion mining setups, but that's not going to catch on in my opinion. Um, the maintenance is ridiculous. The overhead cost is very expensive. And when you put that miner in that oil for the first time, two things, you better not ever want to convert it back to an air cooled miner. I can speak from firsthand experience on that. And two, you better hope that you don't ever have to fix anything on it because it is messy. It's just ridiculously messy. Um, and there's a lot less visibility on what is actually happening under the oil. You have to rely completely solely on, on log files. And if you have a third party firmware, good luck. It's, um, I don't see that catching on for the everyday miner, but, uh, right now the big answer, I don't know what's next. I would like to see hydro cooling become more accessible, but until we see something change, it's going to be, you know, slow and steady little increments on the newest, latest and greatest machines. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think thinking about maintenance cost is a very interesting aspect of it. When the iPhone first had their glass back, I think it was the iPhone X. I remember it was like, a thousand dollars for a phone. And then if you broke the glass on the back, which happens often when people drop it, you know, they normally have a protector on the front or whatever. It was like $500 and only Apple would repair it. So it's just kind of like, it's almost total when you drop it at that point, you're just like, obviously it's not total, but it feels like it's total when you have to pay that, that, you know, half the price again. Right. So you're, and I never, you know, I'm pretty far away from immersion. I just, just being at the Bitcoin conference, there were a lot of people talking about that, but it makes total sense. Once you get the oil on there and you have to replace something, that sounds unbelievably messy. And if you have it in a vat, you're trying to take out that one specific ASIC miner, you probably have to turn off the other ones or I don't, I, it, it, it sounds, it sounds complicated. So yeah, the air cooling, as you said, is always going to exist. And then the hydro cooling is something I need to learn more about. And I want to ask, you said it, it's pretty cost prohibitive for plebs to get into it or, you know, someone who's running a mining shed out back just due to the 
kind of the problem with the CapEx and the OpEx. So the question there is, is that a philosophy you feel like is one that will continue, aka if the if Tatum and his and his and his shed at home can't get into it, it won't take off? Or does that matter in a world where we have billions of dollars coming into you know investments into public mining companies by stock over the next 16 months? Does it matter? Will there be a point where it doesn't matter what Tatum can do in his shed as a limiting factor to overall adoption for hash rate? I think that I think that there's always going to be innovation in Bitcoin mining for plebs to access it. Um, and I say that because we're seeing it on the smallest scale right now where you have these new top of the line just released miners that people are spending uh, be, these companies are spending multi millions of dollars on uh, to a- get access to and only they can get access to them for whatever reason because they're early and they have all the connections whatever um, I personally me I'm probably never going to have a personal hydro miner until you know something changes but you have people who are working on open source hardware and software for singular ASIC miner, ASIC chip miners with like BitX. And someone's going to bridge that gap. And they, they still continue to because BitX even has become more, more like it, it started. I can't remember exactly what the stats were for the original BitX, um, but I think it was only using one ASIC. And now I think that they're using a couple of ASICs and they're better chips as well. And it's like, okay, that alone is a very low cost, uh, very low barrier of entry as far as cost goes. Uh, are you going to you know, consistently make money? Probably not because it's designed kind of to be a solo miner, um, at least in my understanding. But the, the barrier of entry is getting easier to access as they continue to advance the the actual design of it and there's going to be some marriage between these huge deals with these crazy expensive miners and these little tiny over the counter you know couple of giga hash maybe even a tear hash possibly like there's going to be some marriage right there where i'm going to be able to mine with whatever i am comfortable with um, like it, it's going to be whoever you are, wherever you are in your economic, in, in your fin- finances, wherever you are in, in the globe. Like, I think there's going to be access to something that makes sense to you. Um, and I'm not saying you have to pick between having, uh, one tear hash hashing on your computer desk with your bid X or have a couple megawatt facility somewhere or even have to run an s9 like if you say you know what i can you know build a box outside and put x amount of terra hash in there like i think that's going to be possible there are going to be people who are who are making that that bridge and you see it with like um upstream data with their uh their black box like they they made this weatherproof black box uh that uh Temperature control, noise control, you can put it outside, it's it's water weatherproof. You can put, I can't remember exactly how much, you, I think you put three miners in there maybe. Um, but like, that's just something, if you're, if you're able to access the power, cool. That's a, just that less that you have to worry about, you know, hashing. Let me, let me just drop this box. It looks like an electric box outside and, you know, I, I, I got miners going in there. You can barely hear them. You don't even notice them. Um, but the i think that there's always going to be innovation for plebs to mine with whatever capacity they want to mine in you don't you you won't have to pick from a menu of you know three options you are going to be able to say here's how much money i want to spend here's what i can do uh physically at my location um what what can i what kind of setup can i get is that a company that designs something for you i don't know is that just you know more miners on the market that makes sense to you i don't know 
um, there's there's going to be a lot that happens. And I think that the latest and greatest models that are coming out are not going to be the best efficiency always that are going to give you the most hash rate that you can stuff your facilities in. I think the manufacturers are going to start releasing pleb miners. And I, I, I think we're already seeing it with like the, uh, I think it was Avalon that came out with a mini miner. You have Futurebit who's coming out with mini miners, the like the Apollo BTC, love that thing. I got a Apollo BTC one and it was amazing. Um, there's going to be a ton of stuff to pick from that you can mine with whatever. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Well, I guess I, I agree philosophically that I just think that people who are going to try to mine will continue to kind of throw stuff together to make it happen, you know? And as long as that happens, you know, the innovation normally comes from the ground up and then somebody else, you know, figures out how to mass produce it. But I love what Bitax is doing. And I actually got a Canaan Avalon three miner that I won at the Bitcoin conference, which I think is like four terahash or three terahash. So, you know, I think it's going to continue to, to work from the ground up. Um, one of the things I do want to, however, ask before we transition here is where people can find you. Most people watching know who you are. They've watched your show. That's not a podcast. And is it just, uh, are we doing LinkedIn, Twitter, put your YouTube channel? What should I put out at the uh, end of the episode? Those are really the big three, honestly. Uh, you can find me on X, Tatum Turnup, YouTube, Tatum Turnup, LinkedIn, Actually, I think my URL for LinkedIn might also be Tatum Turnup. I think I did that once, but Tatum Cave on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to connect, but yeah, I'm, I'm most active on on Twitter and uh, sometimes Noster as well. Tatum, thank you for taking the time to hop on, talk about decentralization, the centralization of hash rate, the Bitcoin templates. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. Follow us on X. LinkedIn and YouTube at Compass Mining. And Tatum, thanks again for uh, taking the time. Absolutely. 